coconut. The Trek Geeks Podcast Network is proud to have Fansets as its presenting sponsor. Fansets is the place for amazing pin collectibles with over 300 officially licensed Star Trek pins and new releases every single month. Stay tuned for a special discount code good on your next order at fansets.com just for Trek Geeks listeners. Fansets. Our pins have character. This episode is also sponsored by Science Division, the makers of the galaxy's first interactive tribble that you can control with your very own smartphone. Find out more about this amazing collectible and sign up for their mailing list for special offers at sciencediv.com. Science Division. Trouble's never been this fun. Hi, this is Andy Robinson, Elam Garrick on Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and you are listening to the biggest little podcast this side of the Gamma Quadrant. It's the Trek Geeks podcast with Dan Davidson and Bill Smith. Failure to tune in would not sit well with the Obsidian Order. the time traveling communications division of Podfleet Command, where we are constantly monitoring all channels for signals from all eras of the Star Trek universe. It's the biggest little show this side of the Alpha Quadrant, the flagship of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Greetings to you, dear Star Trek fan, and welcome to the Trek Geeks Podcast. This, this is episode number 266, and we are so excited to have you here. And of course, by we, I do mean my co-host... And I, you know, in less than two weeks, I'm going to be getting on a plane for the first time in almost two years to go to Las Vegas for the first time in over two years to go to the convention. And who am I doing it with? Well, this anchor. Well, uh, yeah. And by anchor, I don't mean somebody who co-hosts a podcast. He is the weight around my neck. He is, uh. Dan Davidson and Buddy, um, welcome aboard mm-hmm. to 266. 266, I love it. Thanks for welcoming uh, me as as wonderfully as you always do, my friend. I'm glad I can be that weight around your neck, and maybe I'll just push you right off the cliff. Um, it's great to be Dead here. Dead weight. Though. Yeah, Dead absolutely. Weight. Yeah, um, I, I'm here to serve, though. So, uh, but we're gonna have fun. I can't wait. It's less than two weeks away. Uh, we'll be masked up, of course, and uh, hope everybody is staying safe and healthy. But I'm excited right here. On episode 266, buddy. I'm glad that you are here with me, too, as co-host of the uh, Trekkies podcast. Yeah, Really? Why? I don't know, just because, because you're a wonderful human being. See, that's how you introduce somebody. Just giving you a little pointer from Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Um, you, you people get that in the outtake. I'm just not going to go into detail. <laughs> Yeah, because an actual broadcaster would. Um. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, man, I'm excited. I'm excited about this week's episode. Well, tell us about it. I'm going to tell you. Are you excited about it? I will be once you get the words out of your mouth. Oh, okay. Well, you know what? We don't talk about it very often here on Trek Geeks. We save it for Discovering Trek to talk about Star Trek Discovery. But you know what? Not this week. This week, we are talking Star Trek Discovery. We're going to talk about our favorite moments from Season 3. We're going to talk about our least favorite moments from Season 3, if there were, in fact, any. Um, But in addition to that, we figured, ah, you know what? Let's bring in somebody to help us talk. So, yeah, we're going to have a little chat with, um, oh, I don't know, Anthony Rapp. (laughs) Anthony Rapp's going to be here to talk to us a little bit about the uh, Season 2 release uh, that came out on DVD, Blu-ray, and Steelbook uh, recently. So uh, it's great to it's great. Season three. Did I say season two? Season three. The season three DVD, which is why we're talking about season three. I'm gonna step back and let you talk for a minute, so I can collect my thoughts a little bit better. I'm surprised you didn't need to gasp for air during that. That was a long stream of of just a lot of air in these babies. Yeah, 
Yeah, not much else. <laughs> well, just air, pretty much. Yeah. It's pretty much what encompasses your entire upper torso, including your head. <laughs> but yeah, we're very excited to have uh, Anthony Raff from Star Trek Discovery come by for a really quick conversation. First mm-hmm. off, we want to thank CBS for making him available to us. Yeah. You know, Anthony's been doing a ton of press for Star Trek Discovery Season 3 on Blu-ray, DVD, and Steelbook. And um, and they asked, hey, would you want to talk to Anthony? And we're like, please, of course. Yeah. And so we have roughly about a 15-minute conversation with Anthony coming up later on in this episode. Dan, however, mm. before that, mm-hmm. we want to hear the thoughts of our dear listeners regarding Star Trek Discovery Season 3, and how may they get that to us? Yeah, we definitely want to hear about uh, about your thoughts of Season 3. We loved it. I know that I loved it. I'm pretty sure Bill loved it, too. Uh, the best way that you can do that is to get yourself the Trek Geeks mobile app for your iOS or Android device. You can download it and then tap on the More button for a variety of ways to get in touch with us. And while you're at it, hey, check out our brand new app-exclusive shows that you won't be able to get anywhere else. Just head on over to trekgeeks.com slash app to get all the details. Plus, don't forget about the most positive Facebook group there is. It's called Camp Kittimer. It's the official Facebook group of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Uh, We don't allow any trolling. We don't allow any gatekeeping. You all know that. We only want people celebrating what they love about Star Trek. So go to Facebook, search for Camp Kittimer, answer the few questions, the really easy questions, so easy that even Bill could answer them. Uh, We'll let you right into the camp. And we want to, as always, thank our wonderful admins, Haley, Jackie, and Fark for the amazing job they do running that camp. But Please remember that any comments or messages that you leave us in any of these places may be used in a future episode. Yes. Wow, that was very Marv Albertish. <laughs> um, that's great. But you're not wearing the the really god awful toupee. No, and I never will. Bald is beautiful, my friend. Well, bald you're just beautiful. bald. Let's not drift into beautiful territory. <laughs> Coming up after the break, we're going to get into some How to Vegas with our good friend, Mr. Convention, mm. Ron Robel, Dan. That's going to be very exciting. But first, this message. <music> Dan, as always, we want to take a moment to thank our friends at Fansets for being the presenting sponsor of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Yeah, indeed we do, my friend. We talk about them every single week, and there's a reason why we do. They simply offer the best Star Trek pins anywhere. And they are officially licensed by CBS, which means you know you're getting an amazing product. And they pour their heart and soul into every pin they make. And hey, they just announced a bunch of pins that will be released in the near future, and they are awesome. I'm talking pins like Dr. Jillian Taylor from Star Trek IV, Monster Maroon Captain Kirk, Dr. Pulaski. Guinan. Oh, shut up. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> you, you love Dr. that. Dr. Pulaski's awesome. She is awesome. Guinan, Admiral Vance. Oh, yes. Season three uniformed Michael Burnham from Star Trek Discovery. Jet Reno. Rin. Dude, our buddy Rin is a pin. And that rhyme. Rin pin. That's awesome. Vic Fontaine. A Zindi reptilian. Galron. And General Martok. Just to name a few. So if you had two Rin pins, would they be Rin pin pin? They'd be Rin Pin Twins. But I was thinking about Rin Tin Tin, the, just, the show about the just, dog. That's Rin not Pin on the Pin. copy. You're ruining everything. That list is awesome, man. We can't wait to add those to our collection, including Rin Pin Pin. <laughs> so you know what I'm going to say. Head on over to fansets.com. Check out all their new releases and then put a bunch of those same pins and accessories and, and everything else into your cart. And at checkout, be sure to enter this week's special discount code word, Stamets. That's S-T-A-M-E-T-S in all capital letters for 10% off your entire order. Now, this offer is going to be good until August 4th, 2021 at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Plus, don't forget, if you spend more than 30 bucks on fansets.com, you will automatically get free shipping in the United States. Fansets. Our pins have character. And we thank our friends at Fansets for being the presenting sponsor of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Dan, we have less than two weeks to go 
until Viva Las Vegas, baby, and Creation Entertainment's 55-year mission, and we're just trying to help people get ready. You know, if, if you've never been to this con, or if it's been a while since you've been, kind of like it has for all of us, like about two years, mm. we're going to provide some more tips to help folks Vegas successfully. Less than 14 days. Less. I, don't, I, yes, I would try good. to do. The, I'd try to do the math of how many hours, but I'm not even going to bother because why bother with something like that? Because it's just, you know, I, I don't bother. know. It's just, it's just, you know what? Actually, let me do a quick 336 no. hours. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Wow. Yeah, I I'm pretty sure you Googled that ahead of time. No, I just brought the calculator on my screen. <laughs> So it's, you know, we've had a great time doing these uh, tips for Vegas prep uh, over the last few weeks, and and it gets more exciting each time we do it, not only because we get to count down by one every week, because that's the way it goes, but because for every one of these things, we have Mr. Convention himself joining us to talk about this Vegas prep. Hi, Ron. Ron Robel. Good to see you, buddy. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for having me. So excited to be here. Mr. Convention. Now, mm-hmm. you've been counting it down every day. I know you, you've you been watching a lot of Star Trek to prepare. Um, you've got to be beyond excited at this point. I am very excited. It's been a very busy summer. I've been doing one episode every night in my countdown, my 90 favorite episodes. Um, wow. I'm just so excited to have that last one the night before we fly out. What's it going to be? Oh, that's, yeah, what's it going to be? Oh, or is well, that a surprise? <laughs> Uh, no, I'm I'm going in order of the shows coming out. So it's these are the voyages. So it's not my favorite episode, but the last one chronologically. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's good. I, I actually like these are the voyages. I think it's a fine episode. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a great finale, right? Yeah. But it's I think it's a decent episode of Star Trek. So I I think it's worth watching. Good for you, buddy. Good one to kick off the con. Well, and speaking of kicking off the con, I mean we're going to be there, like we said, in less than two weeks, and well. Things have been in kind of a, a state of flux, shall we say, as far as dining and and where to eat in Vegas. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about tonight. There was some late breaking information today coming into Pod Fleet Command, Dan, that um, a lot of the restaurants that had been closed at the Rio look like they're going to breathe signs of life again, potentially. I think that's great. I think, uh, you know, of, of course, everybody who's been keeping an eye on what's going on, The Delta variant is going crazy. A lot of uh, places have brought back their mask uh, protocols and you need to wear a mask when you're indoors. I know Vegas is one of those areas that that is happening. The state of Nevada has recommended, uh, if not mandated yet, I'm I'm not exactly sure, but you have to have a mask. It's mandated. So you have to have a mask when you're inside the casinos. And of course, that's going to be during the entire convention. Um, So we were concerned about what was going to be going on. And up until today, a lot of the restaurants and bars at the region were not going to be open very much, if at all, during the entire week of the convention. And that brings us to what our topic is tonight, and that's where do I eat at the convention? So luckily today, uh, Creation and the Rio uh, have have released a new list, an updated list of what's going to be available specifically at the Rio. And I got to say, I'm very, very happy about what I'm seeing, uh, Ron. What about you? Yeah, it looks like just about everything is going to be reopened. I know that the big one I'm going to miss this year is the buffet, um, but knowing the Hash House is open, All American Grill is open. Um, and then I was also impressed by the email from Creation showing all the options over the Gold Coast, which is literally just across the street. I've stayed there every year I've been before. This will be my first year at the Rio. Um, so I can speak for some of those restaurants at the Gold Coast. They have some great offerings. You know, they really do. There's a TGI Fridays over there, I think, that's open 24-7 still. Um, and I mean, if you're looking for, you know, for a quick bite or, you know, at least a a restaurant where you know what you're going to get, it's not a a terrible option at all. Looking at the offerings at the Rio, some of them are running different hours. Some of them are running reduced hours. Um, it looks like the all American grill right now is only open Friday to Sunday from 6am to 10pm, which is a major shift run. Big shift. Um, and the thing that caught my eye, too, that I think there's a lot of uncertainty about was Jimmy's Bar um, being open for lunch. You know, it's not high-level gourmet food, but it's really it, it's decent food that's affordable, it's cheap, and it's really easy to grab if it's your first time at the convention. Um, it's the only spot that if you're trying to grab something between panels, it's right there and you can grab it really fast. Yeah, that's really true. I mean, because sometimes having to walk all the way back out to go to someplace like All American or or one of the other restaurants there in the casino, Dan, is a bit of a trek. And then, Dan, you got to walk all the way back. 
It's a bit of a trek. Look at you. You're throwing in the puns. You know, you said State of Flux a little while ago, Voyager episode. You're doing great tonight, buddy. I love it. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right, though. It is quite a haul to get back to the main hotel area. I got to say, guys, all American is not my favorite. So I'm really not too disappointed uh, in the, in the hours on that. But it is good to see that uh, places like Voodoo Steak uh, up on the top of the Rio is going to be open. And, and one of the things we should point out, a place like Voodoo Steak, is if you're going to dine there, we probably would want to recommend that you make a reservation for a place like that because that's that's high level like you were just talking about gourmet stuff, Ron. Uh, so that's a place that's going to be open. Um, you mentioned it, Ron, Hash House. I got to say that's one of the best breakfast places I've ever eaten, not only in Vegas, but anywhere. I am so happy that they are going to be open for breakfast as they're saying now, every day of the convention, open at 7 a.m. And, and open till noon for breakfast. And and that's been a place to enjoy great food every morning and watch all the people walking to the convention area, including a lot of the stars. It's really awesome. Agreed. I, I, the food there is phenomenal. I think it's going to be really busy, too. You know, you mentioned making reservations. I think a lot of these restaurants might be short-staffed. Um, so I'd say yeah, get yes. there early, plan for things to be a little bit slower, be generous with your servers, both in their time and then the tips that you're giving them. Mm-hmm. Um, it'll be interesting to see from what I'm seeing. It looks like Hash House is open every day. Starbucks at the convention center. They didn't mention the other one by the tower. Um, so right. I think breakfast offerings may be a little bit tougher to come by. Um, personally, I'm thinking I might just get some food and keep it in the room for breakfast so I can grab it and just run right down to the convention each morning. Yeah, I can't say they blame me there. Another option is there's a new Denny's across the street from the Gold Coast in that plaza where the Walgreens is now too, um, which was not there two years ago, at least not to my recollection. Although some of that may have been alcohol fueled, allegedly. <laughs> you know, Ron, you brought up a good point a little bit ago about, you know, being sure to, to be kind to your servers. And I, I think that's true of the hotel staff in general. These are people who have been through a lot. And this convention is the first one there in o- almost a year and a half. So they're kind of getting their sea legs again in in dealing with a whole bunch of people. And I think it's going to be really important for us all to exercise a little kindness, Dan. Yeah, I I totally agree. And one of the things that I think might, I I could be complete, this is complete conjecture on my point, guys, but I wanted to point out that, that a couple of years ago when we were there, we talked to several employees at the different restaurants at the Rio and the people who work at the Rio themselves. And I'm wondering if that not only because of the amount of people that are going to be there is why they're opening all these up, but these people told us that this week is their favorite week of the year. They love the Star Trek fans coming into the Rio. They love the convention. They really have a great time with all the people and having conversations. So I really like to think... And I'll, I'll, I'll say I'd like to think that they're doing this because they want to be there to help us. So hopefully they will have the staff. But if not, like you guys said, you got to be patient. You got to really tip them well. They're working hard. They're doing what they can so that we enjoy the convention. So make it worth their while. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's funny. Um, we talked about, you know, getting some lunch. Um, probably the restaurant that's the furthest away from the con has got to be Smash Burger. But arguably... <laughs> It's probably one of the best destinations at the Rio. It will be open daily, but not until 4 p.m. Monday through Thursday. That's a change. Friday and Saturday, they're open from 9 a.m. to 2 a.m. That sounds about right. (laughs) Then Friday through Sunday, they're open 24 hours. Yay, team. Wow. You know, know that's all. That's always a favorite of mine. I know it's a favorite of yours, but oh, yeah. you know, we mentioned reservations a bit ago. I, I would think if you can try to default to a reservation for everything, because they're going to try to control crowds at these restaurants too. There's open table. There's the resi app, R E S Y on, on iOS and Android. Um, and also check with your hotel, you know, concierge to be sure that you know, if there's a restaurant you're looking to get into that you can. I'm not looking to correct you, Bill. I just want to make sure we have this right. Smash Burger, it looks like Friday and Saturday, they're 9 to 2, and Sunday, 9 to 10. I think you oh, might have my been bad. talking about the sports deli that they're going to be open my Friday, Sunday, 24. That's okay. That's all right. Yeah, no, you're right. So Friday, Saturday, 9 to 2, and Sunday, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. That's the host's mistake. Okay. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. <laughs> Absolutely. And of course, at night, um, it's good to see, uh, for those people that have gone to these conventions at the Rio for so many years, the Masquerade Bar is kind of the place to go. They are going to be open uh, until 1 a.m. Uh, every night during the convention. What is not on this list, gentlemen, which I'm very sad to see so far, and hopefully it will be updated, is Bill and I's favorite place to have a nice drink at the end of the evening, or five, is the eyeball. 
bar. So we'll see or what happens five. with that. <laughs> now, now, Ron, I, as I understand it, the masquerade was only slated to be open essentially Friday night and Saturday night. Is that right? I remember seeing that. Yeah. So this is really exciting. The fact that it'll be open every night that we're there. Um, and I have never been to the Masquerade Bar. Like I said, I've stayed at the Gold Coast and kind of hung out over there. So very excited to see that that happen. I know that that's a really popular spot. Can't wait to hang out there. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens there. Because usually, I mean, it's you're, you're you're trying to get elbow room at Masquerade. It is literally elbow to elbow in there. Mm-hmm. And if masks and social distancing possibly are the rule of the day, Masquerade could look a lot different, Dan. Oh, I absolutely agree. It is it is elbow to elbow. It is it, it it spills out into the main floor where there are still slot machines all around the Masquerade Bar every single night. There's just tons and tons of people there. So, um, the masks is one thing. If there's masks, that's fine. It can still be crowded. But if there is social distancing in that area, it is going to be extremely different than what we're used to. So it's just a question of uh, what'll happen when we get there, Ron. Agreed. Um, one more thing to even escape the bars I wanted to mention as far as food goes. Um, I, I love eating out with people, seeing people, but Postmates, Uber Eats are always an option too. Um, I've already played with a few people to kind of order in <laughs> outside restaurants and eat them in the lobby and find a place that we can sit out there to eat. Um, just because we know reservations will be hard and there will be lines. Um, and I have never, I've used Postmates, but if you sign up for their like deluxe service with free delivery, you get your first month for free. Um, so it can save some oh, money wow. for you too. There That's you pretty great. You know, and plus uh, the Rio is not the only game in town, obviously. There are restaurants. And uh, all over Las Vegas, literally hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of restaurants all throughout Las Vegas, all looking to welcome people back, which I think is amazing. Uh, Do you guys have a favorite restaurant in the city? Ron, I'll let you go first. Yeah, mine. I've got the reservation already. It's actually the Gold Coast um, Cornerstone Steakhouse. It's, you know, nothing formal. It's great steak, great prices, and it's so convenient to the convention. Dan, what about you? Oh, you know what I'm going to say, man, at least for up until this year, because I know we're trying something new that I've been looking forward to when we get out there this year. But Ramsey Steakhouse uh, at Paris is is phenomenal. I have enjoyed going there every year that I've gone to uh, the convention with you. Uh, it's fantastic food. It's a great atmosphere. It's a little pricey, but it's worth every single penny. Mine is a Mexican restaurant in the fashion show mall, El Segundo Soul. It's right across. I mean, if you're sitting there, you're looking at the win. You know, you're looking at Encore right out the right out the open air uh, sort of entrance. And it is some of the best Mexican food I've ever had in my life. Plus, it's not super expensive. It's a really great meal. And um, they'll make your guac table side, which I'm always kind of a fan of. You Yum. Know? Yummy. <laughs> well, it looks like we've got uh, plenty to consider as far as eating. Um, I will reconvene next week to sort of wrap it up, guys. Ron, thank you so much for joining us. Thank and, you for having uh, me. We'll talk to you again next week. And everybody, don't forget to head on out to creationent.com today. Get all the con info, check the latest information, and get your tickets because we're going to have a fantastic time. Friends, if you haven't checked out the Galaxy's first interactive triple from Science Division, then you are you are missing out on so many levels. Bill, so many levels. All the levels. Because, I mean, this officially licensed triple is one of the most amazing high-quality Star Trek collectibles I've ever put in my collection, Dan, and I'm sure that is true for you as well. We both love ours. So much work and creativity went into creating this triple right down to the softest fur you could possibly imagine. Plus, the sounds the Tribble makes, truly straight out of the original series and the Trouble with Tribbles, you will swear it was delivered straight to your door directly from Space Station K7, Dan. And you don't need to buy them with Spikem Flame Gems, which is which is a bonus when you think about it. it. It's a, a big bonus. Big bonus. Plus, the Science Division Tribble has its own app that you can use to control the Tribble. It's not necessary, but it is a lot of fun to make it scream at people like, I don't know, annoying podcast co-hosts. Uh, fret not, however. Everyone except Bill knows that, you guessed it, troubles are not dangerous, my friend. Yes, they are, Dan. They're very dangerous. Haven't you seen the trouble with Edward? Stop. So head on over to sciencediv.com right now to pick up one of the galaxy's first interactive tribbles for your very own. Plus, I mean, while you're there, check out 
their shop accessory section where you can get all kinds of science division swag like t-shirts, mugs, or even the science division tote bag, which comes in very handy at conventions. Oh, good point. Coming right up in less than two weeks. Science division. Trouble's never been this fun. And we thank our friends at Science Division for sponsoring this week's episode. If you're looking for some great Star Trek t-shirts or even other gear to add to your life, then be sure to check out the Trek Geek store on TeePublic. In addition to our own merchandise, you can directly access all of the officially licensed shirts on the TeePublic platform just by going to shop.trekgeeks.com. And when you use that link, you're automatically helping to support the Trek Geeks podcast network with every purchase, whether it's from our store or not. With over 150 designs available and new merchandise being added all the time, you are bound to find something perfect for the next Trek Tuesday or 55-year mission tour in Las Vegas in less than two weeks. Plus, TeePublic constantly has special sales and discounts going on, so you're going to want to check back often, like maybe right now to get ready for Vegas, I'm just saying. But it all starts by going to the Trek Geek shop today at shop.trekgeeks.com. Well, Dan, one thing is certain. That's you and I had a great time talking about Star Trek Discovery Season 3 on Discovering Trek. Mm -hmm. And now that Discovery is being released on physical media, we figured let's talk about it a little here on Trek Geeks. It only makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. um, Season 3 of Discovery just came out last week uh, on DVD, Blu-ray, and Steelbook. I got to get me one of those Steelbooks someday. I've never done that. I have Um, one. Is it really made out of steel? Can I really hit you in the head with it? I think it's it's just some kind of metal based thing. I don't uh, think it's actual steel. No, Maybe okay. I'm wrong, right. but I've gotten all of the new Star Treks on awesome. Steelbook. That's fantastic. Yeah, I have to check it out. But um, it doesn't matter what form you get it in. Season three was just absolutely awesome. So you know, we figured we have not talked about Discovery very much, if at all, here on Trek Geek. So let's talk about some of our favorite and least favorite moments of season three of Discovery before we bring in a special kind of guest to talk about it a little bit too. Hmm. Wow, that's a great idea. I wish I'd thought of that. That's, uh, well, you know what? You're not the president of this company for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am? Wow, no, do I get no. a limo? No, no. Sorry, we sold out. Oh. Sorry. So, you know, one of the things I like about season three was was the time jump. I know at the end of season two, you and I just weren't loving the idea necessarily. Uh-uh. And we didn't think it was necessary. And while I still don't think it was necessary, I thought that the jump to the year 3188 was something that they handled really well in establishing this sort of new normal for season three. Oh, I absolutely agree. I was not happy at all with how they ended season two. And I've made that very clear over on Discovering Trek. I thought it was a cop out. I thought it was a way for the writers to not have to worry about dealing with canon. And I was really concerned with how they were going to do that. And if it would really be Star Trek or just another science fiction show set a thousand years in the future. Um, But... uh, they, they made it Star Trek in every way, shape, and form. They were able to have some elements of canon that we all have known to love uh, in the season, even so far into the future. And I thought they did a fantastic job. And, and dare I say that season three is my favorite season of Discovery so far. As each season got you know, become progressively more your favorite. So season yep. one was obviously your favorite of the seasons at that <laughs> point. But then season two, you liked even more. And you like now season three more than two? I do. There are so many aspects of season two that I really love. Of course, Captain Pike was was one of the best parts and everything that happened with that storyline. But I think that the way that they told this story for season three was really well done. I, you know, we both talked about how the whole cause of the burn was something that was a little different and something that we didn't expect. But at the same time, they wrote it really well. Um, so I was I'm very proud of what the writing team uh, over in the writer's room what Discovery has done with season three. And it just makes me look that more forward to season four, to be honest with you. No, I have to agree with you. You know, we talked with Rod Roddenberry a few weeks ago. And of course, he's one of the executive producers of all the new Star Treks coming out these days. And one of the things we talked about was that season three storyline of the burn and its ultimate wrap up. You know, how it really was a manifestation of the grief of Sukal, who watched his mother die before him, mm-hmm. which is one of the, the worst things a child can see happen. Yep. And then to have to deal with it, knowing that he, essentially there was going to be no one to raise him other than holograms. Um, I, I thought it was a fascinating way to build that story. You and I didn't necessarily like how long it took to get right. there. Mm-hmm. 
because the payoff didn't necessarily equal the buildup, mm-hmm. but I thought it was a payoff that was well crafted and well written, um, even though it was deferred way too late in the season. I agree, and, I, and even though it did take too long, I got to say the emotional punch in the stomach of that yeah. ending was worth the wait. Um, I thought that they yeah. handled that very well um, in both acting and story and everything. So yeah, I, I agree with what you say 100%. I thought it was ultimately satisfying. I appreciated mm-hmm. that it wasn't one more big bad villain that they had to to, to kick its ass, exactly. essentially. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, there was enough of that with Osira and the chain, but uh, <laughs> more about that in a second. Um, <laughs> you you have a list of things that you really loved and disliked about the season. Yeah. Um, some favorite, least favorite. So why don't we go through some of that list and we'll talk about them. Sure. Um, uh, of, what would you say was your, your most favorite aspect of the season? Well, I think... The- for me, um, for how I have reacted to certain things that have happened in Discovery that call upon Star Trek history, the Guardian of Forever moment was the moment of the season for me. The whole idea of Carl saying, I am the Guardian of Forever, while the original Guardian voice was saying that at the same time, and then the reveal of that door being the Guardian that we all know and love with the new special effect version that blew me away i was so excited when that happened and uh i really thought that they did a good job in bringing that into discovery still a couple of questions on how a big stone donut was able to travel to different planets uh but that's for a question for another day but uh, that was my favorite moment of the season a big stone hashtag big stone donut (laughs) (laughs) well you know it's interesting because i mean you figure if the guardian of forever can place you at any point in time or in this case in any parallel universe in Mm. time then i have to believe it has the power to wind up somewhere else like how did it get on the planet it was on initially in the city on the edge of forever We, we we'll never know um but i thought it was at least plausible and i thought it was it was great to give that character if you will that backstory yeah um and to know that it went forward to know that it couldn't you know, necessarily be misused or harnessed for evil, I thought, was an incredible aspect because it's self-aware. Yeah. Um, I really dug that a lot. It's funny, as I, as I thought about The Guardian, when it happened and then afterwards, it's like, I, I, first I'm thinking to myself, how come nobody knows about this? Even if Starfleet made it classified, there were certain people I'm sure that would have known about it. But then again... The episode with City on the Edge Forever didn't happen before Discovery went to the future. So that's why yeah. nobody knew about it. And I, I just thought it was really well done. I know there were people that were pulling their hair out over it, and I really don't care because I thought it was fantastic. I loved it. Um, I thought it was a good way to uh, wrap up uh, the whole Philippa uh, story arc for now. <gasps> Hashtag maybe. Um, uh, but uh, we'll find out. Hashtag Big Stone Donut. You know, thinking about it, in season two, they had the reveal of, of Pike's accident, which mm-hmm. we loved. In season three, they had the reveal of the Guardian of Forever. It makes me wonder if there's going to be a, as equally a jaw-dropping moment in season four as a Trek callback. I really and, hope they do. I, I, it, 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 if they don't, it, whatever. But if they do, it'll be great because it's kind of been a hallmark. Like you said, they also had the Telosians and the Return of Talos IV. Yeah, um, that was yeah. another huge jaw-dropping moment. Um, I think it would be good if they threw it just one in every season so that people could just like like literally have their heads explode. It's done a great job of tying the entire Star Trek universe together yeah. Yeah. and sort of merging what came before with what exists today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, something else they did that was a really great job of merging what came before with what exists today are two particular ship callbacks Mm -hmm. and which i know were among your favorites yeah absolutely and that would be the voyager j which was completely like wow and then just uh, just a very heartwarming moment when we saw a starship uh, at starfleet headquarters the uss nog i thought that was just a wonderful wonderful tribute to aaron and what he did uh, for star trek it, it was just great. I mean, there were some weird looking ships in there, man. But I'll tell you, seeing those two names on those ships was really something. It tells us that Nog becomes one of Starfleet's greatest officers. Mm-hmm. And man, that is so awesome. It is. It really is. When we've talked about how Nog has the biggest character story arc in possibly all of Star Trek. And that's just the icing on the cake to see a starship named after him. Of however far into the future, how many, a thousand years in the future. Just awesome. Yeah. Now I'm going to tell you one of my favorite moments is I'm going to 
completely rip off and steal from your list because <laughs> I, I can't not mention it. And I realize I employed a double negative there, but eh, sue me. Eh. Um, it's the return of Ken Mitchell to Star Trek. We have said all along we want him to just play every Klingon in every season. Right. But the best part is, is we got to see him without any prosthetic makeup whatsoever as Aurelio. And man, I, I brought tears in my eyes the first time I saw it. It, it. I actually did a double take. I was actually like, is that Ken? And yeah. I was just so happy to see him return. And and I'll tell you, folks, we're talking about this release of season three, Discovery on Blu-ray and all the other different formats. You have got you have got to watch the special um, add-on of this about Ken Mitchell and what he's dealt with with his diagnosis. It is you are going to shed tears, many tears. It is so well done. It is so great to see him back uh, in Star Trek, and I hope he. I really hope we see him in season four. I think we will. Um, I just hope we do. I really hope we do too. You had another character this season that became one of your favorites, like almost right out of the gate. <laughs> and I can't. I can't blame you here because I've really loved this actor's work for a long time. A long time. I, I was just giddy when I saw Odin Fair show up as Admiral Vance. I was a little concerned at first because how many times, Bill, have we seen an Admiral show up in Star Trek who looks great and he's a bad admiral? I did not want that to happen with Vance. And I was I was nervous right up until the finale of whether that was going to be the case or not. Um, he wasn't. He's fantastic. He looks so good in that uniform. I can't wait to get my picture in Vegas with him and his autograph. That's going to be one of the highlights. And he was a highlight for season three for me i loved what he brought to the up to the whole series i'm gonna have to break out my discovery poster and find it and add him to it <laughs> you yes. the one that i've gotten signed yep. you know, each of the last couple of seasons absolutely um i, I there's got to be room uh, no, oh, i'll sure. make room make i'll room. make room yeah um, absolutely yeah he was fantastic as the admiral i really liked him i thought i thought admiral vance was a great character and a, a great foil for burnham somebody who really kind of held her feet to the fire on a couple of occasions and I, I thought it was I, I thought it was a character that was well written, and I really enjoyed him. Yeah, um, I I can only hope we're going to see Odin Fairback for more of season four. I have to believe that's going to happen, and please don't let him meet the same fate as Katrina Cornwell. Please. Oh my gosh, absolutely! It, it was great to see him. He did not take anything from anyone. He was a strong admiral. He he was focused. He he was looking at the end game all the time, which I thought was really great. Um, and it was interesting to see him clash with Michael from time to time, but I always liked how those clashes ended. I thought it was, I thought it was, it was good character growth for, for Michael and for Admiral Vance, even though we'd only seen him this season. No, definitely. Um, what other of your favorites from the season are on your list? We'll punch through those before we get to some of the items that maybe we wish could have been done a little better. Yeah, there were a couple of other things that I really liked. I, I really, really thought an, an emotional moment for the entire series was when uh, the former Tal symbionts became one with Adira, I guess is the best way to call it. And she could hear them and see them when they were um, in the pool. Uh, um, Adira and Michael were in the pool. Uh, I thought that was a fantastic moment. The the emotion, not only from Adira and Michael, but for the other symbionts, I thought was really great. I really liked that. I think that's one of my favorite episodes of the season, simply yeah. just for the way it was shot and for the story overall. And I thought it was just beautifully done. Mm -hmm. um, and plus all the nods to, to the Trill home world yep. and all the, the references that we all know were born out of Deep Space Nine, um, you know, really kind of warmed my heart a little bit. I just thought it was executed extremely well. It really was. And the special effects in those scenes were really great. And just, yeah. I can only imagine the amount of time that was put to do all of that with all of those like strands of energy coming together and everything. It was really well done. All the actors did a great job. Um, so yeah, that was another highlight. And and one of the other highlights, Bill, um, we've talked about how Discovery is a is a family. The crew of Discovery is a family, and they deal with family issues. And I thought that the new family dynamic for Stamets and Culber with Adira and Gray was another highlight for the season. I really liked that aspect, especially in the finale of the season. Uh, they promised they were going to get Gray back somehow, um, and it was it was really great. Great acting from everybody, also, and for that whole family dynamic. Here, here, I I thought it was the most important aspect of this particular season yeah. with so much that was different and so much that was chaotic. There was this family unit that came together and was born from it. And I think that makes them probably stronger than ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really, really appreciated that aspect. 
So before we have our special guest on, let's talk about some of the aspects that we might have changed or hoped would be a little different. What yeah. leads the list for you? What, well, what leads the list for me, it's kind of a two-parter. I got to say, um, I loved, well, I, actually, no, let me take it back. Osira as a whole, I didn't really care a whole lot for the character. I really kind of thought she was a weak adversary for Discovery and the Federation. The Emerald Chain is a different story. They're tough. They, they, don't, they don't have any problem killing people whenever they need to. I just didn't buy that it was as ruthless a chain as it was with her as a leader. So I thought that was kind of a, an imbalance going on there. And this is just me personally. Janet Kidder is a, a very talented, wonderful, beautiful actress. I thought that chin prosthetic was extremely distracting. I didn't think that she needed it for that character. Every time she was on screen, my eyes were focused on that, and it took away from every scene she was in, to be honest with you, at least for me. I, to me, I, every time I saw her, it made me think of the Wicked, Wit, uh, the Wicked Witch from The Wizard of Oz mm. because it, it really kind of channeled that, that vibe for me. Yeah. You're right. It was unnecessary. She didn't need it. I thought she was, you know, a, a, a tough enough presence without sort of that modification. But I agree with you overall. I think the chain actually could have been even a little more fearsome. But I don't think Osira was the leader that, that kind of, you know, made me shake in my boots to some extent. Absolutely, and and no no discrediting the prosthetic team because you know they're war- no. they're up for Emmys and stuff like that. I just thought that that was. I- I'd like to know what the thought process for that was, and if anybody else really had a problem with it because it just it didn't look right. It, right. It, right. It. This is one of the first time, and we've seen hundreds and hundreds of aliens in Discovery. This is the first time that I ever saw someone with a prosthetic on, and I'm like, that looks fake. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we had some some issues with some of the work in season one with the Klingons. Right. Ultimately, we liked it, but there were aspects we thought that could be different to allow the actors to sound mm-hmm. uh, like you could understand them better. Yeah. Um, without having to read captions in English. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That'll be good. We don't have to do that anymore. I think one of the aspects that you and I may not necessarily agree on is the state of Earth and Starfleet at, you know, post-burn. Mm. Um, whereas you didn't necessarily like how xenophobic they had become. And I was all right with it because it showed that, you know, Starfleet may have to evolve and change. Um, ultimately, have you, have you resolved how you feel about it or do you still not like that aspect? No, I, I really think I have the whole idea of it. When we first saw it, I was like, really, this is supposed to be this utopia and everybody's welcome. And we're going to, you know, grow and learn from our mistakes and from our successes. And then to see them having a complete shield around the planet, not letting anybody in, not letting anybody beam down, having, you know, security have to check everything. I was really surprised, but over the course of the rest of the season, earth, learned and was starting to become more open and so me as well i thought that um, i was more open to the idea of why it happened um it's hard to think of something happening on a galaxy size scale like the burn and how it can affect cultures and i don't think i really thought about that at the time i was more thinking wow gene would have he would have gone crazy with this type of of plot line but i think it works for what happened with this season of discovery no i have to agree with that i mean I, I think there are aspects of that that could have been done a little differently as well. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, it's weird to think of Starfleet not being headquartered at Earth because yeah. that's been part of Star Trek since its creation. And one of the things that really I was really questioning, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm not going to get the character name or the location right, the fact that Earth abandoned people that were on another planet building a society which mm. was part of that whole episode, was very troubling to me. That's not something I would expect to see in the future of Star Trek. But the burn isn't something we expected to see in the future of Star Trek either. Well, yeah, that, that's a really great point. Yeah. And then lastly, I mean, we said goodbye to a character this season that we didn't want to have to say goodbye to. And although the character is still alive in the Star Trek universe, who knows when we're going to see them again? I hope we see her again. You know, she, she, was, she was only in a few episodes, but uh, Commander Nan really really had a following. She has, she has a lot of fans. She had a great storyline. Um, and I thought that last episode uh, where she decided to stay on the ship uh, was very touching. And I really loved the performance. Um, and I'm going to miss Commander Nan. And I'm glad that she's not someone who was killed off because we will have the opportunity, hopefully, to see her again somehow 
in another season of Discovery, whether it's season four or later or maybe somewhere else. But uh, uh, I, I was sad to see her go. Yeah, I agree. I, I at least like the storyline that they created. We got to learn a little more about the Barzan. Yeah. Um, which I was very ex- I mean, I was excited when they included a Barzan character in Discovery, you know, to know that um, that race, which was, is in one episode of TNG, mm-hmm. got a little yep. more love and a little more um, uh, of their history and, and, and backstory filled out. I thought it was fantastic. Great, great world building by the Discovery writers. And uh, I just, I'm sorry to see her go. Yeah, Rachel did a great job. And, you know, anytime that you become a fan that's pinned, you know that you've hit it up well in the Star Trek universe. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, Dan, speaking of fan sets pins, somebody else has a fan sets pin, and mm-hmm. we're lucky enough to have a special guest for this particular episode. Yeah, we, yeah, we really are. You know, Bill and I are so excited to welcome this week's special guest. We've been hoping to talk to him for years, and the planets have finally aligned, and we're so happy to have him joining us here on Trek Geeks and Discovering Trek. This amazing performer has been in show business for a long time. You've seen him predicting that Brenda's probably dead when singing about the babysitting blues and the classic adventures in babysitting. He played the role of Mark Cohen in the Broadway production of Rent back in 1996 and then reprised that role in the film version of the show and then the show's United States tour in 2009. He has a huge list of amazing accomplishments in show business, but here on Trek Geeks and Discovering Trek, we know him best as Lieutenant Paul Stamets on Star Trek Discovery. He and his co-star Wilson Cruz are beacons of light for the LGBTQ community, and as season four approaches, we can't wait to see just how pissed off he is at Captain Burnham for what happened at the end of season three. He is the one and only Anthony Rapp, and Anthony, it is an honor to welcome you finally to Trek Geeks and Discovering Trek. Thank you so much. My pleasure. You know, Anthony, as we're doing with pretty much everyone we're fortunate enough to have on the podcast these days, we want to ask how you and Ken are doing. Are you both staying safe and healthy in these really weirdest of times? We are indeed. I mean, we were able to get our um, first shot of the vaccine up in Canada, but because their supply is, uh, you know, limited, um, we didn't get our second shot until uh, after we got home to New York, just like almost almost exactly two and a half weeks ago. Um, So we're fresh, we are freshly fully vaccinated uh, and, and happy that we are now able to visit family that we haven't seen in 16 months. I mean, it's so we're, 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 you're catching us at a particularly good moment. Um, We were together in Toronto for the nine months of, of my work on Star Trek discovery with our cats. Um, (laughs) And uh, we were really, uh, you know, we were, we were really, able to do our best to take care of each other and take care of our cats but it was also very challenging because toronto was on total lockdown the whole time so when we when i wasn't at work we were essentially in our apartment there and you know we could take walks we could take bike rides and stuff like that but it was it was very um it was very isolating also well we're really glad that you're both doing good (laughs) thank you we're grateful to be in the world and be able to reconnect with people Excellent. And, and thank you both for getting vaccine. Of course, it's a very important message that we like to spread here on the, on the podcast. Um, Anthony, one of the things I love so much about what you and the entire cast of Discovery does is really engage on Twitter. You have a fantastic page where you really have a lot of stuff that you talk about. And when you were cast as Stamets, you actually started doing a complete watch of Star Trek. And I think at one point you were working on Deep Space Nine and Bill and I mentioned it to you a couple of times um, through Twitter and at conventions that DS9 is our favorite. So I thought I'd check in with you and see how you're doing with that watch. Have you completed DS9 and moving on? And what are your thoughts about it so far? I'm a bad student. I I <laughs> got off the rails. I'm sorry. I, I, the, I was getting a little frustrated with um like the availability of some of the episodes um on de- depending on where I was. Some of the apps like the the resolution was really poor. Yeah. Um. And if, when when we were in Canada, it was harder to access. So I'm I'm behind in my DS9 watch. But what I've seen, especially a couple episodes in particular, were just really stunning. So I get it. I get the love. <laughs> believe me but i and i also like i know that there's like arcs like when there's a six episode arc and when i do an arc i want to be able to really burn through it and sometimes it's just hard to have that time to 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 delve and to have to be able to do watch six episodes in close succession right so i have to get back to that task i'm i'm slapped on the wrist 
No, no, not at all. We get it. I mean, you know, I, I think I've probably watched Star Trek through two different times, the, you know, all of the episodes since the lockdown started. And, and now I'm struggling to find other things to watch. So um, it, it's a challenge. But let's talk about season three of Discovery a little bit. And of course, season three of Star Trek Discovery beams down on DVD, Blu-ray and limited edition steelbook on July 20th at your favorite retailer. God, that's such a great plug. This was an amazingly ambitious season that that truly took us where we've never gone before, arriving in the 31st century. How important was it for the show to step out of established canon and break new ground? I think it was really important for our writers um, to to be able to cut loose and uh, you know stand on the shoulders of everything that's gone before, but not be um, held back by it. Uh, and so I'm, I was excited when we, I mean, we, I kind of figured it early on that that was very possible and likely that we would, you know, we would start, we would establish ourselves as like a nice, like little glimpse of the time between the time that had been unexplored in the, in the history. Mm-hmm. And then I really thought there was a chance that we would yeah somehow go off into the new, the new century where to tell totally fresh stories. So I was, I was happy for them. I was happy for us. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's been like a, you know, cut loose, spread your wings kind of thing. Um, and it's been very cool to see our designers and our props department and our writers just find really fun, cool new ways to think about what might be uh, the technology that's available at that time also the cultural changes that have occurred within the Federation, it all, it all makes sense. I mean, they, they did the wonderful thing when, you know, I love good world building, but world building has to, it can't just be like, Ooh, that's a cool thing. It has to, to me, it has to feel like it makes sense it, that it connects to authentic ways of being. Um, and I feel like they did a really good job of doing that as well. Oh, absolutely. And speaking of that, congratulations to Discovery and the cast and the crew for all their Emmy nominations last week. That was that was awesome to see. That's well-deserved, and hopefully they'll take home a few trophies. Um, particularly, yeah. Anthony, with, with your Stamets character arc, it's been pretty big in the three seasons of Discovery so far. Now, I'll admit, when we first met you, your character was a little arrogant and kind of rubbed some people yeah. the wrong way. Um, but we've yep. seen this character grow so much. You know, he was, up until recently, the only human being to be able to guide the ship through the mycelial network he suffered such terrible loss with the death of hugh and then got him back from the dead literally and now kind of has a family with culber and adira and gray and and we're looking forward to more growth with the apparent issues that he has with burnham in season four but my question is how much input have you been able to provide for this for your character's growth and do you really enjoy what's been happening with your character over the three seasons that we've seen so far I loved the I loved all of it uh, honestly to to get to do things you know like on the one hand be like a super brilliant scientist that gets to help save the universe all the time that's pretty cool in <laughs> itself but then to have it um really balanced by the depth of emotional um you know life and and the and the quality of the relationships um that's very fulfilling to have a bit of all of that and then have like nice little comic you know repartee with with pig and you know i just feel like i get i get a full meal all the time um uh so yeah i'm i'm i've i've loved playing this role um but i'm also in i'm in some ways also uh glad that the 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 strife a lot of the strife is behind me um you know went through it went through the ringer and uh, so now I get to kind of um, reap the reap the benefit of going through such hard hardship. <laughs> if that makes any sense. No, it it actually does, and, and it's amazing. I don't want to give any spoilers away from Deep Space Nine because you're still working on it. But one of the things that we thought with Deep Space Nine is the character that had the best and biggest character arc was actually Nog, played by the late great Aaron Eisenberg. And I got to say, yeah. for me personally. In Discovery, Stamets is the one that has that arc that I look to as being the the most uh, rounded and it's the most um, uh, detailed. So congratulations on doing such a wonderful job with that with that character, because he really is a fan favorite and he's one of my personal favorites as well. Thank you. Oh, and I realized I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't answer one of the part of the question, which is um, input. Yes, um, honestly, I don't I don't 
I don't, I don't feel a need to give input. I mean, you know, every once in a while, if there's a theme that comes through and there's just something about it that might, like there's some words or the turn of phrase that just doesn't quite ring. Um, I'll, I might raise that and just go back to the writer and say, is there this, this way that this is written? Just, I wonder if it could be just slightly rephrased. That's the extent of it, honestly. Um, if there was, if, if there was something that came through and it would be like, whoa, that's what the hell is that? I would speak up, but mm-hmm. I haven't had to because, uh, what I'm given to do feels it, it, it feels grounded and it rings true and I understand it. So, um, I'd much rather kind of like let them guide me and and take the ride i feel like that's part of the excitement about being an actor especially on a on a long-running serialized show where your character does get to go through changes mm-hmm. you know i'd rather kind of like lean into the mystery of it than sort of try to dictate what i think should happen you know what uh, just to pivot slightly 2021 anthony marks the centennial of star trek's creator gene roddenberry whose hundredth birthday will be celebrated by fans on august 19th if you had the chance to meet him or like the ability to time travel, if that existed, what would you want to say to Gene today? Wow. Um, thank you for changing my life profoundly. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, from, from things that George Takei has said, uh, mm-hmm. I understand that Gene really did want to find ways to um, tell LGBTQ stories. So I, I feel confident that he'd be very happy that we were telling those stories in his universe now, but I would just also want to just thank him for, you know, at least being willing to have the conversation with George to be his ally and supporter. And uh, just to, I don't know, ask his blessing might sound like a weird way of saying it, but just say, I hope that you're happy with what we're doing with it because sure. we feel, we feel like we're standing on the shoulders of everything that he created. But um, I'd like to, I do believe wholeheartedly that he would be happy with it and that he'd be happy that finally it happened. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. And as I said in my intro, you are such a beacon of light, both you and Wilson, to the LGBTQ community in Star Trek and on Twitter and on social media. So we really, really thank you uh, for that. It, it's really awesome to see that. Um, another thank awesome you. thing that you do, Anthony, you and several members of the cast have been doing during the pandemic and beyond is Disco Does D&D. Um, yes. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit how that came to be? How's it going and how people can actually watch these dungeon runs? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been wanting to play a game myself for a little while. And then I started playing a game during the pandemic with a, a friend who's a DM based out of uh, L.A. So I was like, fine, I get to play a game. And then so when we were talking about coming back for season four, we were like, yeah, let's play a game because like Noah, Mary's Mary's husband, Noah, who played Rin in season three, yep. um, was trying to put together a game. And then then we started just putting is anybody want to join us? Come on, come on. So we do like this little cheerleading email chain. And then, uh, you know, happily, people did follow up and were serious about it and committed to it. And then Noah walked, you know, there's some newcomers or some people who played before, like Blue has played before. Um, I have played before. But uh, I believe everybody else was a newcomer. Um, maybe Mary had played. A, I'm not sure Mary had played before. She'd like listened to podcasts. So she was a little more aware of it. But then everybody really took it seriously and created characters with, you know, like did the whole backstory stuff. Mm. And, and then Noah, um, you know, he's he's not he hasn't been doing it for very long, but he's been excellent at giving us putting stuff in front of us. That that's fun and interesting and rich and challenging and weaving together our backstories into it in a very exciting way so it's just a it's just been a wonderful um method of of exercising our creative muscles together um allowing us to connect during the pandemic and while even though we were all in toronto together working we we couldn't really spend time in person with each other because of the protocol so um which normally we're a very close cast we're very we're very much a family we right. have meals together we do game nights together we you know, we go to see movies together. We do all that stuff, but we couldn't do that. So this was a wonderful way to help take care of each other during this really, really challenging uh, nine month period. That That's fantastic. Now, just in case people do or don't know, are you going to be in Vegas uh, in a few weeks? Yes, I'm going to be in Vegas. Excellent. Well, uh, we are going to look forward to seeing you shaking your hand if shaking hands is available in Vegas and is something that you are okay with. If not, maybe a fist bump, also- but... <laughs> 
Yeah, fist bump for sure. But I'm also doing a concert in Vegas as part. Of yes, the you are. Oh, that's right. Yes, yeah. you are. Yep, absolutely. Can't wait. That's going to be Saturday awesome. night. Yeah, it was really exciting because you know I love doing concerts, and I just approached the organizers like, "Is this something that you know you you you'd let us do? Because we I would love to do it." And and they were like, "Yeah." So um, my wonderful longtime accompanist Dan Weiss, who was in the original Rent band on Broadway. We've been doing concerts together for several years, and uh, he's a fantastic musician. He plays both piano and guitar, so you know, depending on which song, he'll play one of uh, one or other of these instruments, and and it'll be a nice, intimate um, evening of singing songs that I love to sing. And uh, so I'm just happy to get to do that in in the in the very supportive and loving environment of the Star Trek convention, and I hope people enjoy it. Well, I'll tell you what, we can't wait to see you. We can't wait to see that. To me, you're always Daryl from Adventures in Babysitting Man, one of my favorite roles ever that I had you do. It's just, it's just so great. Um, we love you at Stamets. We can't wait to see what's in store for you and your character and your family in season four. Thanks so much for joining us here on Trek Geeks and Discovering Trek. And we will see you in just a few weeks, my friend. Thank you so much. Take care. Well, Dan, um, we are so grateful to have had Anthony come by the podcast. Um, he's been wanting to do our show ever since Star Trek Discovery premiered. Mm. Um, and and it's great to have him on, even if for a little bit of time. What a great conversation. It really was. He's been someone that we've loved uh, chatting with the conventions, and we've talked to him on Twitter. And and um, just to be able to have him finally on the on the network is really something that we're we're happy with. He's he's always such a wonderful person. He he is a beacon of light. Uh, I think I said that during the conversation. And and uh, I hope that we can get him on uh, sometime in the future for a more lengthy conversation because this just just what's the appetite so to speak it really does it mm. really does and of course to remind everybody star trek discovery season three blu-ray dvd and of course steelbook blu-ray right. available now at your favorite retailers that sounds like a plug it does i guess it kind of is in a way and i like it <laughs> <laughs> we're not making anything from it but i mean go get that i mean we're big on physical media right Dan? right absolutely and that's yeah. because we yeah. love to talk about five-year mission wow I know, they, who are all the music you hear on every episode of Trek Geeks and other shows across the Trek Geeks podcast network, Dan, including mm. Five Year Mission, the podcast. What a great name. I know. Imagine hearing Five Year Mission, the band, on Five Year Mission, the podcast. Mind blown. Talking about Five Year Mission songs, maybe. And other things. That's 5YM cubed when you think about it. I don't think that's cubed. I think that's squared. Well, the t three things. You're a square. <laughs> Shut your square. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Continue. But head on out to fiveyearmission.net. Get all their discs. You know, you want that physical media in your hand because it's yours and nobody can take it off a streaming media site. Oh. And, and then you lose access to it. You'll always have it. So fiveyearmission.net, get all their CDs and, and check out their podcast on your favorite podcatcher today. Absolutely. A hundred, a hundred percent agree with that, my friend. Nicely done. Nicely done. You know what else I love besides the way that you talk about five-year mission? Cheese. I love cheese, but I also really love the penultimate episode of TOS. It's awesome. It has time travel. It has romance. It has great science fiction storytelling. I know you remember it, buddy, because you're you're awesome with TOS episodes. It's a planet that's about to be destroyed by a sun going supernova. Kirk is being sent into its past to a time where drummers and musicians were thought to be witches and were executed. And Spock and McCoy are thrust into the planet's ice age where Spock reverts to his ancestor's savage emotional state and falls in love with a beautiful woman. All Our Yesterdays is a great episode that shows us just two examples of Mr. Atos's vast library that stores all the past of the planet Fark Peden. So check it out. It's the penultimate episode. All our yesterdays. Fark Peden, Mr. Atos, Spock, McCoy, Zarabeth, Kirk as a drummer witch. It's awesome. Check it out. Isn't it Fark Pidian? Fark Pidian. I said Fark Pidian. No, it's Fark Peden. I actually thought of that when I was writing this up, and the spelling of the planet 
is the I E is before the D, so it's but Sparkpedia. don't they pronounce it as Sarpedian? Well, the he episode? also says sabotage, so it could be wrong. You sabotage, never know. yeah. So piece so of trunk. Quality. You know, you're just looking for reasons to downplay my awesome Farkisms, and it's not going to work today, sir. I'm just going to put that out right. There. I'm only surprised you didn't call it all our Farkster days because that would have been dumb. Like no, you. that actually makes more sense than Farkpedian. Sarkpedian, Farkpedian. It sounds the same. Doesn't it? it no. <laughs> it's dumb like you. I just said that. I just said that a second ago about you. Anyway. I know, I know oh, you are, are, but what am I? Oh, yeah. I'm rubber, you're glue. What, wait a minute. Yeah, that's the right one. Yeah, okay. I got it right. Bounce off me. Yeah, it sticks to you. Yeah, yeah that sounds okay, go. great. Talk. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not Sarkpidian, it's Sarpidian. Sarpidian. No, I said Sarpidian and Farkpidian. I yeah, threw the no, K in extra. sound the same. It's because oh, you're a God. moron. So don't forget... <laughs> Uh, you can get even more access to all this great banter by supporting the Trekkies Podcast Network on Patreon. I mean, who wouldn't want more of this, Dan? I know, this is riveting. Um, forget the perks. Forget the t-shirts. Forget the pins. Forget the unedited episodes. You can get more of this bitching back and forth. <laughs> and if it's not riveting, if we're frogs, would it be riveting? Oh, I hate you. I knew you. You knew I was going there, didn't you? You just knew it. No, but, you know, I... I didn't. Wow. I, I feel like to think of you better than that, and unfortunately, you're just not. No, I I, I just give you every reason to not think of me as that good. Anyway, uh, we want to thank our associate producers for Trek Geeks. They put up with this, and we really don't know why, but we're so thankful for their support. And they are Vikram Bhatt, Luke Burnham, Brad DeMag, William Edward M. Jr., Patrick Escudero, Brandon Everidge, Andy Fark, Kimberly Francis, Jonathan Hamilton, Ryan Jeffs, John Krikorian, Sean Lynn, Jamie McGregor, Aaron Mollenkoff, Casey Pettit, Helen Reed, Tim Robertson, Greg Rozier, Sarah Rutlinger, Eric Sakian, Adam Sanders, Tim Serdar, Heather Sohn, Blake Strike, Rick Tatro, Lisa Tomlinson, Jessica Dax Vincent, Ron Robel. Ron Robel, that name's familiar. I, I don't know why. I don't know. And the gracious and wonderful Connie Hutchins. That so gracious, so wonderful. Dan, our producers of the Trek Geeks podcast are Mike Bovia, Chaz Bradshaw, Kyle Castillo, Peter Craig, Andy Davenport, Craig Ewing, Jackie and Chris Hackney, Kimberly Hartman, David Hood, Julianne Jordan, Lionel Marchand, Rick Mason, Matt McGonigal, Jim McMahon, Darren Metcalf, Charlie Mulvey, Sean O'Halloran, Jamie Rogers, Casey Shafsky, Jim Stoffel, Chris Trebuzio, Ken Tripp, Christina Werther, and the lovely and talented Jess Vashon. Dan, the senior producer of Trek Geeks, is the constantly cheerful Jude Tatman. Constantly cheerful. He is a room full of cheer. Yes, he is. You two can become a producer. What? Constantly. Constantly, yes. <laughs> this is fun. You two can become a producer of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network, and it is so easy to do. Head on over to patreon.com slash trekgeeks for all the details. Dan, next week, our bags are almost packed. We're ready to go. And that means we're getting ready to head to Vegas on the 55-year mission tour with a special Vegas-themed episode. Yeah, indeed we are, my friend. Every year before Vegas, we deep dive into an episode that reminds us of Vegas in, in some way, shape, or form. And, and next week, we are thrilled to do it once again after a COVID-induced year off from it. Uh, the away team of the Enterprise-D beams down to a strange planet and finds a mysterious revolving door literally in the middle of nothing and then find themselves trapped at the Royale. We deep dive into the fifth episode of TNG Season 1 next week on Trek Geeks, the flagship of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. You know, we just want to say off the bat, if you hate the Royale, check yourself, because this is an awesome episode. <laughs> I think I gave it a skip it the first time we did see it or skip it, but I'm ready to I watch think, it again. I think you did. I, I think you're going to appreciate it. I mean, it, either way. Uh, yeah, you know, we've talked about how Move Along Home has a third season right. TOS vibe. Mm -hmm. This one takes that third season TOS vibe and makes it a TNG episode. Cool. Which is very different. Plus, I think there's some really good writing in here. The fact that they acknowledge that the story of the Royale sucks. <laughs> like right off the bat, you yeah. know, it was a dark and stormy night. And you see Picard just go, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like when I'm talking to you every week. Exactly, yes. Of course, for more great Star Trek discussion, we want everyone to check out the other member podcasts on the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. In addition to the litany of podcasts we have here on Trek Geeks, 
We have a few new ones that we really want you to check out. Obviously, there's the Sci-Fi Sisters. We love them so much. We're proud to bring you that show each and every episode. But in addition to them, we now have With the First Link with Matthew and Ruthie, as well as Science Station 2 with Haley Stoddart. And um, who knows where we're going to stop, Dan. There's Drawn to Trek with Aaron Harvey and an entire cavalcade of co-hosts. Um, we're just, we're getting it done, buddy. And we want everyone to check out these shows. You can find all of our podcasts, including where to listen by visiting trekgeeks.com slash listen. Constantly cheerful and cavalcade of co That's a lot. Wow. You're doing good today, man. I appreciate you. I really do. I've had my coffee. There you go. The Trek Geeks Podcast Network. No one talks Trek like we do. And certainly nobody alliterates like we do either. Of course, for all the news on all the Star Trek series, please visit our great friends at treknews.net. For now, this has been episode number 266 of the Trek Geeks podcast. We do hope you all live long and prosper. Coconut, uh, 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 C-O-C-U-N-T, coconut, uh, I didn't spell it right. That's okay, I'm doing a rap because we have <laughs> Anthony rap, but that's okay. You... <laughs> Are you concussed? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm going with. I like it. We'll do it. Music for Trek Geeks is provided by Five Year Mission. They're writing an original song for each episode of Star Trek. Hear more of their music at fiveyearmission.net. Trek Geeks is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Hi. Hi. Bing bong. Bing <laughs> bong. Bing bong. Bing bong. Bing bong. Yeah. Hi there. Bing bong. I put my Hi. pants on. That's a first for you. That's a great line from Men in Black 3. <laughs> I would have to have seen Men in Black 3 to know about that. Men in uh, Black 3 is fantastic. I find that hard to believe. Men in Black 2 is horrendous. Mm-hmm. Absolutely horrendous movie. It was the first movie Sue and I ever saw together when we started dating. And Men in Black 3. And she, and she still married you? I know, really. And Men in Black 3 is fantastic. It is a great, great story. And Brolin is awesome as Tommy Lee uh, Jones' character in the past. I highly recommend Men in Black 3, buddy. I don't know. Oh, okay. So you talked me into watching episodes that I didn't like so that I'll like them again. Well, but I mean, Star I've Trek. Always, ah, come on. Give me a little bit of credit. I do good with movies. I do give you a little bit of credit. That's why you have a podcast. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right, people. I want you to hashtag Men in Black 3 and tell me what you think about it. I'll do it. It sucks. <laughs> you haven't seen it. How can you say it sucks? The second one sucked. First second one was meh. The second one was horrible, and Men in Black International, what I've seen of it, is not good at all. The first one is meh at best. Yeah. First one is... I like the first one, but I love the third one. I think the third one is is excellent. So I saw the second one in theaters, Ugh. and I was sitting there in Lowell, Massachusetts, at the Showcase Cinemas, mm-hmm. crowded theater. I think I was like <laughs> maybe tenth row, sitting dead center, and of course the the Columbia Pictures uh, opening teaser dun, graphic dun, comes dun, up, dun, 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 and dun, dun. and the or maybe I think it's Columbia, and the and yep. the woman that is part of that logo takes puts on the shades and takes out the yeah the the forget Neuralizer. me stick or whatever it's called Neuralizer, Neuralizer. yeah. And it goes off, and immediately in a crowded theater, I said, what am I doing here? <laughs> Everybody just died laughing. That's awesome. And that was probably I, the best part of the movie. It actually was. Yeah, yeah. It really was. It's not good. It really, that is not a good, that is not a good movie at all. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So, anyway. Yeah. So, that, that was quite a tangent we got right off of the bing box. You took us there. And I know, and I love it. It's fantastic. All because you finally put pants on. I, I know. And, and with what's going on with the Delta variant, I might just take them off again. <laughs> you might have to. <laughs> Jeez. What a-
Freaking stay mess. at home 47.0. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, obviously it, here we are with less than two weeks until we arrive in Vegas. Mm-hmm. I think we're at 13 days, 12 days. I don't know, whatever the hell it is. Something like that. Um, I'm going to actually check my phone as I, I, I vamp think until I think I'm it's 12 ready. days from now. Uh, it is 12 days till now. Yeah. yeah. And uh, obviously now there are mask requirements in place, not just from the convention, um, but also from uh, Las Vegas itself. Right. So wherever we go, wherever anyone goes that's going to Vegas, better have your masks. Yep, absolutely. Just to say. And I'd like to thank all of the, um, not the people that can't get it, like if you're under 12, parents who take their yeah. kid to a convention yeah. under 12 are idiots anyway because they're not vaccinated. But any of these people who are not getting the vaccine for other reasons, anything other than they cannot get it where they are, thanks. Thanks for causing this problem because it's all your fault. That's the way I'm looking at it. <laughs> you know, six, 60 days ago, we didn't think we'd be in this position. Yep. Um, now, granted, there are still a bunch of guests going to the 55-year mission in Vegas. Mm-hmm. I think they're at 109 guests yep. who are still going to be there from right. Star Trek. Yep. Um, some notables have dropped out, Sonequa Martin-Green, LeVar Burton, yep. Jonathan Frakes, um, and some others. We probably will see some others drop in the next 12 days. Oh, I'm, pro- I'm positive we will. Yeah. yeah. In addition to some attendees. Uh, I mm-hmm. wouldn't be surprised to see that, that that's the case as well. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit um, in, the, in the How to Vegas segment, but How to Vegas. there are a lot of hotels that, that aren't running full restaurant availability, including the Rio. Right. Ugh. Yeah. My, my eye bar. <laughs> well, your breakfast. I don't know. The eye bar is more important. <laughs> yeah, I bar and masquerade only open Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, oh, that's wow. Um, that's, wow. And we get there Monday. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I have to deal with you without having anything to drink for a week. Oy. Oh, time to bring your flask. Exactly. Um, or, or I 20 did not of them. say that. I did not flasks. say that because you're it. not supposed to sneak things into the convention, and I would never do that. Oh no, I would just use in the room. At that point, I'm just going to break out the bottle. I'm not going right. to bother with the flask. No, not, yeah, just drink it right out. Hoo hoo! A little bag, a little brown bag with a little bottle sticking out of the top. Like mm. what? <laughs> <laughs> if anybody wants me to do that live in Vegas, just remind me. How did you not go into voice acting? I mean, you saw the panel with Dee Bradley Baker for Star Trek Prodigy. I yeah. mean, some of the sounds he made. Or yep. just, uh, they were not human. You could very easily do that because you're not human. I, well, that's true. But I, I you know, it's something that, you know, it's, you, it's funny that you say that because that's something that I wanted to do when I was a kid. And I just never, I just never did Followed anything through. with it. Yeah. Like yeah. Mission Log Live had um, the guy who played Shax on the other night on their show. And it was great. Yeah. He was, he was great to, to listen to. And he's, he's well known. Fred uh, Tassior, is that how you pronounce his last name? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Something like that. But anyway, um, he was awesome. And, and yeah, it's that. And, and the other thing I always wanted to do, I don't know if anybody knows this, I always wanted to be a bartender, which is probably why I like doing the martini stuff I do these days. Hmm. Yeah. Mixologist. Is it because the hours suck? Uh, that's probably a good point. But you know, I mean, I wanted to go into food, but I mean, um, I hate working nights. Yeah. And largely, if you're working in, in some kind of, of cuisine as a right. chef, you're, you're working a lot of nights. Right. Yeah, that's probably... At least I'd... until you become superstar level. Right. Well, that wouldn't take Or long. owner level, but still. Wouldn't take long at all. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, I thought sure. of another one the other day, and I actually... I thought this up because I opened the freezer, and I had a bag of these, and I'll get to what they are in a second. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if they have that kind of martini. Just joking. Looked it up. There's a recipe for it. The Charleston Chew Martini. Absolutely. Sorry now? Yeah. That's what I, yeah. Yep. I just said it as a joke, and I did a Google search, and yeah, there are recipes for it. So the Charleston Chew, a candy bar that was made locally here in the Massachusetts area for decades, Mm -hmm. has a martini. Yeah. Um, I I think I would be afraid of that, quite frankly. And and what's great is the garnish is a mini Charleston Chew. (laughs) Can you still get those? (laughs) Well, I get the one. They have these little snack bags, and they're they're little balls, and they're Charleston chews, and I throw them in the freezer. I've always liked Charleston chew from the freezer. I don't like chewing them, all losing my teeth and fillings and all that stuff. Uh, I gotta but, think it'd be even worse if you put it in the freezer. You break a crown. Nah, nah, they're not that. They're not. It's not like rocks. It's nougat. They are once you put them in the freezer. Ah, come on now. Have a little faith. Of the heart. 
I hate you. <laughs> I get to throw it in every week, and I don't even no, you, try No, anymore. you don't. You don't have to. <laughs> I know, but I like to, because it drives you crazy. <laughs> it's not just me. You know how many people hate that damn song? I know. It's just a reminder think of that the it listeners, will be with us man. forever. No. Well, think see, of the listeners. It, so. Just it doesn't the matter. Is fine. But yeah, but you, you claim matter. that people don't hate fart. That, blah, 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 let's try that again. Let's, re, let's rewind. You claim that people don't like farkisms, but they love them, hence they are every week. Oh, no, no. It's <laughs> not that I claim it. You get direct <laughs> feedback from our Patreons on Discord. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, that tell you, you that when they suck. Well, that's all right. I still do them. Because you know what? Can I because they suck. Ah, it's fun. <laughs> You could always improve if you put in the effort. And here we are back to voice acting. <laughs> Full circle. Uh, all right. You know then. what we call that where I come from? Ring, ring, ring. That's a callback. <laughs> I didn't need to go to the Connecticut School of Broadcasting to know that. Oh, not a lot of people had to. It was fun, though. <laughs> For, there's for, for there's, the three weeks you were there, oh God, no, that was a long, that was a long stretch, dude. <laughs> it was the longest four weeks of your oh, life, <laughs> man. Whew, I didn't think I'd get through that first weekend, <laughs> <laughs> and that was just a party. And they're still around too. That's the that's the amazing thing. I never thought that they would they would last, but they're still down there in Boston and other locations. Connecticut School of Broadcasting. <laughs> wow, if that's what they taught you, you really they should get didn't a refund. Teach me that at all. That was just natural born talent. Yeah, pretty much. I actually uh. remember doing. We had to do a like a news segment, and I did my news segment wearing my Data TNG uniform and talked about the Franklin Mint chess set. It was on video and everything. Really? Yeah. Uh huh. I went all out. <laughs> it was pretty funny. I- you don't have the video of this, do you? I don't. No, not anymore. But I. Oh my doing god, that, that yeah. would have been amazing. Yeah. yeah. See, back way back then, even. Loving it. I I just I don't have words. So this would have been like <laughs> this would have been like late like eighty nine ninety yeah. maybe yeah right around there yep yeah I think in the late eighties I don't think it was nineties yet I don't remember I have to I have to look at my diploma. <laughs> <laughs> Did you actually get a diploma? Oh yeah they got yeah the whole nine yards. I thought yeah. you didn't finish. Oh no, Connect School of Broadcasting I finished absolutely. Yep, I had no idea. Oh yeah. Yeah, I did. I we've joked around that you flunked out, but I yeah. mean, I don't no, think no. I actually knew. No, I did. I got the. I got through the whole thing. Yeah, Whew. all twelve weeks. <laughs> glad I put it. <laughs> glad I put it to good use. Right, <laughs> hosting a podcast that has like six listeners. Thank you. Hey, that's not my fault. If maybe <laughs> if you'd completed your training, young Jedi, we'd uh, we'd have a lot more people listening. Wow. To this, okay. This turd. So once again, it's my fault. I'm glad you recognize wow, it because the rest of the Michelle too. lately. <laughs> Damn it. Damn. <laughs> All right. So um so we've covered a lot of ground here and I'm tired. So um <laughs> Yeah, let's get this over with. Now seems like the perfect time to start recording a podcast, doesn't it? It does. Absolutely. If any of you out there are thinking of starting a podcast, um and you think, Wow, hey, I'll get my best friend from twenty five years to do a podcast <laughs> with me, just don't take a look take a good long look in the mirror. Or listen. I mean uh, just just really reflect. <laughs> <laughs> what a jerk. All right, you ready to do this, jerk? Yeah, let's do it, buddy. Let's go. The Trek Geeks Podcast Network is proud to have Fansets as its presenting sponsor. Sorry, just a little Connecticut School of Broadcasting thrown in there before that was I really horrible. start. I know, I did it on purpose. Okay, here oh. we go. <laughs> Okay, now we can stop the cut. Co- you we almost can stop the outtake. <laughs> no, no, we can't. You almost need to do it like Marv Albert. Oh God, no! Yes, <laughs> but don't bite anybody's back when you do it. Oh my! Coconut. <laughs>